The scripture reading for this morning's lesson will be taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Romans 12, 9 through 21. And I'll be reading out of the New King James. Let love, without, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly, affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Certainly good to be with you this morning. And you might be asking, this lesson and the timing of this lesson, well, I will tell you, there's no more important thing to talk about than controlling our anger. And uh, let me find the clicker. Man, I just need to, oh, here it is. Looking for a fight. <laughs> You'd be surprised. You know, in these times, I went back and looked. I think we were talking with Jeff and Darren the other, the other night and looked, and it had been exactly four years that we had gone through this selection of elders and deacons. <laughs> and this is, this is a difficult time. I mean, there's um, a lot of emotions involved in this. Men who may desire the office and think they're qualified or, or may not be qualified, but somebody else wants them to serve. And... Um, and then if you're not picked, you know, there's anger, or maybe remorse about why didn't they pick me and, and, um, and maybe finger pointing, you know, I can't believe they did that. Cause, and, and, and so you're going to notice, and, and I think this obviously applies broadly, not just about, you know, what we're dealing with right now in selection of, of elders and deacons, but just in general, um, anger is something that we all is a challenge for, for all of us. In fact, statistically, um, 10% have trouble controlling. This is stats um, I found on the web regarding anger. 10% have trouble controlling their own anger. They admit 10%, one out of 10 people say, I have trouble with anger. I have anger issues. 25% worry about how angry they sometimes feel. So people worry about, you know, I feel angry. It's going to be hard for me looking at him. I, I spent a good bit of time with him this morning, my little grandson there. And oh, I should have said good to see you, Mariah and Riley back here as well um, are with us today. And all our visitors, of course, appreciate you being here. So if I look distracted once in a while, it's because I'm going to try not to look in this corner. Uh, but many folks have trouble with anger. 60% agree that people in general are getting angrier. I don't know if you noticed that or not. It seems like, you know, watch the news. It seems like there is a, and just pl the politics, people in general seem to be more angry than they used to. So some experts suggest that on average, adult gets angry about once a day. Annoyed, peeved about three times a day. So other anger management experts suggest that getting angry 15 times a day is more likely the realistic average. <laughs> and so you're going to get angry. And sometimes you don't know what's going to, what's going to cause it. I can tell you last night we were playing cards and I've actually cooled down on cards a good bit. I, I told uh, Sue's mom, I said, you're going to be in my lesson tomorrow. She had no idea what I was going to talk about. Uh, we were playing seven up, seven down. And Sue just went and had a perfect game. Well, she never got set one time. It was like, you had seven hands up, seven down, 14 hands and never get set. It's very unusual. Well, I was on my 12th hand, and guess what? In the next game, I had not been set. 
And you know anything about that game, you start off with one, you go up to seven. It's hard to, to not get uh, to make your bid when your seven cards are out. You get down to two and one, you know what? Your odds are pretty good. So I got two hands left. I'm up 30 points. I can just cruise on out. And sure enough, I get one of those hands and I, and I get set. That's okay. I'm still up 10. Only one card being handed out the next hand. Very unlikely they'll get set. They turn a club over. I got the queen of clubs. And I even started doing the stats in my head. Okay, it's less than 2% chance that somebody's got the ace or king. And her mom was being really cool. If you think about her mom, usually I can read when she's got a good card in her hand. But she pulled it off. I, I, I got to give her credit, man. She pulled it off. They dealt her the ace. And I didn't know I had the queen. And I got set. And I ended up finished fifth in that hand. I went from first to fifth. And I got to admit, I was a little bit angry for a little bit. I cooled off because I thought, you know, this stuff happens. But that's going to happen to you, right? I don't know what's going to cause you might get angry today. But cards is one of those things. If you can't play cards and not get upset once in a while. But that's okay, being angry. And we're going to notice there are times when we should get angry. It's not the anger that's the problem. It's what happens after you get angry. And that's really what we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about. In fact, there's something I could, I could entail this righteous anger, or I call I entail the righteous battle. We're going to first focus on. Then we'll talk about wisdom and anger and forms of sinful anger. And time permitting, we'll, we'll cover how to handle anger. And so I talk about it's okay to get angry. How do we know it's okay to get angry? You know, God gets angry. He gets angry. And, and uh, verse 11 of their Psalms, chapter 7 says, God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. God gets angry every day with the wicked. In 2 Chronicles 36 and 16, it says, but they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people, till there is no remedy. So God gets mad, even gets mad with his own people, gets mad at the wicked every day, gets mad at his own people when we don't do what he wants us to do. Romans 1.18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppresses the truth of unrighteousness. And so God gets angry, right? And so if it's okay for God, I know it's okay for me. Not just God, Jesus expressed righteous anger there in Mark 3, verse 2 through 5. It says, so they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had a withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill, but they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, he knew it was in their heart. They didn't care about this man, his withered hand. They only cared about tricking him or trying to catch him in something. And he was angry. And what did he do? What did he do? Being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And so he restored his hand. It was okay for him to do that, but he was angry at those, at those men and for what they were doing and where their heart was. In John chapter two, this is probably the most prominent example we have of Jesus getting angry there. Verse 13 says, now when the Passover of Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, he found in the temple those who had sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and poured out the chambers or changers money and overturned the tables. He said to those who sold doves, take these things away. And that's the exclamation point. He's yelling at him, take this stuff away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. They were, they'd made a mockery of God's tabernacle and he was angry. He got real angry about it. He not only got angry, he, Threw him out. He yelled at him. And so it's okay to get angry. Even for Christians, we can have a righteous anger. James 1.19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Doesn't say you can't get mad and get angry and, wrath and have wrath. It says slow to wrath. Controlled. 
Having control, that's the important part. Romans 12, 19, 21 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written. Vengeance is mine, I will pay, say the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungry, feed him, if he's thirsty, give him drink. And doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And so we see there, he talks about rather give place to wrath. There's a time for it, right? And so there are, there's a time when we need to fight. And we need to get angry and get upset. We don't need to be this melancholy kind of just calm all the time. And, 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 and there's, trust me, it's good to have control. But there's times when we need to get angry. We need to be upset. We need to have a, a righteous fight. And the important part to understand is righteous anger is not vested in self-interest. That's the big difference. Most of the time we get angry because it's something that's done to us or affects us. That's what we get angry about. That's not righteous anger. Righteous anger is when we, when something's being done, it's against God. That's when we need to be upset and get angry. And it can move us out of apathy to accomplish what we need to achieve. When people are lost, there are people out there who are lost. It's Matthew 7, 13, 14, enter in the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which will go in there at because narrow is the gate and straight is the way and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there's few who find it. And so we know there's a there's there's a broad way. Most people are going to go down the broad way and be lost. And that should that should upset you. How angry should you should you feel and be upset that a family member is going to be lost? You, you, you should be angry and upset to the point where you're willing to do something about it and not just let, it, let that person just, just be lost. I'm not going to let, I'm not going to let it bother me. That's not, that's not the way we should be. We should be um, get uh, angry, a righteous anger there when we see people who are lost. Exposed deceivers. We talked about this deception in class this morning. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. You ever been around someone that said something or did something and you knew it wasn't true? How does that make you feel? Get angry? And you, want, you may let that slide. I've been in presentations where my boss has said something I'm like, that's not right. But I didn't, I didn't, he's in a big, front of a big crowd. So I didn't talk to him then. Or I might, you may let some of those slide because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's something to the world. But we talk about what happens when people deceive folks in, in believing what's something that's true that's not true when it comes to, to the word of God. Somebody tells you, all you got to do is believe. You don't need works. You don't need works. We talked about uh, works in our class in James and, and Peter this morning where it, by our works is how we're going to be judged. If somebody's willing to teach someone and say, you know what, all you do is believe. Does that get you angry? You get upset? It should cause us to want to do something, right? That's That's the righteous anger we need to have is the point where we're so motivated. I'm not going to let this person I love be deceived into believing a lie because it, it, it could jeopardize their soul, their, their children's soul and their grandchildren's soul. So we need to have a, a, a righteous anger and we need to be willing to expose deceivers. We need to defend the truth. In, uh, in Jude 1 and 3 says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to, con to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And so we need to contend earnestly. That means when, the, when false doctrine is being taught, we need to speak up. You know, sometimes, and, and I can tell you, if someone comes up here and preaches something that's false, Elders dare not sit there and be quiet and let it be taught. And I, I, I remember um, up in, in Park Road many years ago, um, a lady wanted to get up and she wanted to read something. And, you know, I'm being a young man. I'm like, well, okay. She, she was repenting. She was coming forward. She was going to repent. I thought, okay, that sounds good. And, and here, she Walter said, no, you're not going to, 
Yeah, you got something you want to be said, you tell me, and then I'll and I'll share it. And you know what? He was so he was so right. She was going to use that as a platform. She wasn't repenting. She was coming up there and was going to use that as a platform to, to tell something or teach something that was wrong. And so we need to have that righteous anger when false doctrines being taught. It should really fire us up. Even out in the world, when things are being taught that are false and not right and cause others to be lost, to stand for the truth, defend the truth. We need to defend the innocent. There in Isaiah 10, 2, it says, to, to rob the needy of justice. Of course, it turns off, right? The most inconvenient time. To rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people. The widows may be their prey and they may rob the fatherless. Matthew 23, 14, woe to you, scribes and Pharisee hypocrites, for you, you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will re receive the greater condemnation. You ever see someone being picked on? Somebody being treated unfairly? You know, when I was a, a freshman in high school, we moved to Bellsville. And I was always a little guy. I was never, I mean, I'm over six foot now, but I wasn't always over six foot. I was short. You know, I've told that joke about, you know, Beth, Beth and I being the end of the line. I hated that when they made us stand in the line. It just reminds people I'm, I was, I was really short. We moved to Bellsville and I had people coming up to me and say, you in the sixth grade? And no, I'm a freshman. I was four foot 10. In fact, I used to have, I used to have a program. I had that. Me and the other guy that was four ten, his nickname was Run. He and I were the same size. But you know, there was a guy picked on me. I was actually a really good basketball player. They didn't know that over there, but I could play hoops and I could handle that basketball. And this guy was a sophomore, but he was a star on the basketball team. And it was I don't know the first second uh, practice. You, you had to play around and you had to play one on one. You played to ten. And he had to play me. And he probably laughed. You know, I got to play this little short guy. Do you know I beat him? And that made him so mad, he picked on me for a couple of years. But the Lord blessed me. I didn't stay short for very long. And I, I can tell you, when I met him for intramurals, I had a ball. Because now I, he, was, I wasn't, he wasn't looking down on me. We were looking eye to eye. And I just said, in my entire life, I've, you know, if you ever had, you ever got bullied, you ever had somebody pick on you, you know how it feels. And when you see that being done to someone, it, it, it really bothers you. And it, it really bothered me, even though that happened for a short period of time in my life, I knew what it felt like to have somebody pick on you and look down. Somebody innocent, they didn't do anything wrong, but for whatever reason we feel, or individuals feel like that person's a target. It's not the way it should be. But we see, and does it bother you? Well, you, you, you stand by and let someone pick on someone? You say, well, I'd, hey, that's just, that, that's what happens when you're, when you're a freshman. The innocent are going to get, they're going to get tortured. They're going to get tormented. I hope you feel that we need to defend the innocent and stand up. And you, and you know what? It's okay. There's a time there to fight. And when, especially when it comes to defending someone who's innocent. There is a righteous fight to be fought. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. When we sin, where, where sin actually comes in anger is when it's due to self-interest. We get angry and we do things because of something of our own self-interest. And you know what? Someone is going to do something to you. Someone's going to say something to you that's going to get you angry. And you may not be able to defend yourself, but when does it become wrong? You go off, right? I'm angry. I go off. I don't speak. I don't speak to them anymore. And I, and I let that, that, that I get angry, upset, and just let that stir, right? Just let that anger stir in your heart. It starts changing your heart. What's Jesus say there? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. 
Don't give place to the devil. That's the devil working, right? You may be totally innocent. You're totally innocent in it, but what was done to you caused you to get angry. You go off, you sulk, and you are getting so mad, the devil's got you, right? Because what happens next? Because then you start doing things, right? And feeling towards certain individuals a certain way. That's when anger becomes wrong. There's a time to fight, but there's a time. We dare not let that get the best of us. In verse 14, again, Romans 12, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, repay no one evil for evil. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him, he starts to get him drink, you'll, you'll heap coals on his head. And don't become over, overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, there's a time, and I hope that when you see these situations, that you respond the way you should. It's just natural when somebody does something bad to you to lash out, right? Oh, I can't wait to get him back. Oh, I couldn't wait so I could play, uh, meet up with this guy. And I'll, I, I remember playing it in my head. I'm like, I, I wonder what I ought to do to this guy, man. He picked on me, and now he can't pick on me anymore. And, and you just let that kind of simmer in your heart, and, it, and there's no good comes out of it. Fortunately, I did the right Christian. I was a Christian man. I did the right thing. But you, the devil will use that, right? And he'll get you to do things and say things you shouldn't. Um, he always say, you know what? You messed with the wrong person. I'm going to get back at you. Uh, you start trying to get other people on our side. You know what so-and-so did to me? You know what so-and-so said to me about them? And so a little story I made up, and this, even though I use some of the names or some of the people in this church, there's nothing to do. This is a totally fictitious story. So um, Jim falls out with Jeff. And he said, Jeff cheated me in this business deal. And so Jim gets upset. There's no Martha here. So he, Jim tells Martha that Jeff cheated him. So now those two is between them. Now he's told Martha that, you know what? Jeff cheated me. Martha tells Judy, you know what? Jeff cheated Jim. Judy tells her whole family, Jeff cheated Jim. And guess what? Jeff and Jim get together, and Jim made a mistake. Jeff didn't cheat him. He, he miscounted something. Didn't cheat him at all. Guess what? Everything's great between Jeff and Jim, right? But what happened about those seeds now that went to Martha and to Judy and Judy to her family? They don't know that. That's what happens. And I'm telling you, it happens a lot. There's things that's happened in this congregation that happened that way, where there, there, an issue came up, somebody talked to someone. Before you know it, that person maybe talked to one person, but then they told somebody, and then they told somebody. That all, in the meantime, all this got fixed, but nobody knows it. Somebody out, out 100 miles away from here thinks that the, uh, this person or, or this issue is a big issue, and it's not. It was resolved. That's the way things happen. And so we need to be careful. Uh, Proverbs 25 and 11 says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. So the next time somebody tells you something bad about someone, think about, you know what, this is, this may or may not be true, but I'm not going to share it with others because you know what, it's not, no good's going to come of that. So we need to be careful. Vengeance belongs to God, not us. It's not for us to figure it out and, 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 and cause harm to that person that belongs to God. Rather, we're told, cling to good. Cling to those things that are good. It says, love, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. You know, again, I recall a situation where someone said to me about something about someone said, you know, I don't know if this person's going to tell me the truth. And I thought to myself, I know that person. That person's not going to lie to you. Your goal may have been to get me to believe something bad about this person, but it ain't going to work because I think about the good in them. And if you've got an issue with someone, go talk to them. Don't, don't be spreading rumors and talking to other people about it. 
but rather just talk to them. In love and honor, giving preference to one another, rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Be of the same mind toward one another. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And so we need to cling to what's good and not focus on what we think is evil. You know, um, Martin Luther King's Day, it's celebrated now. And, you know, I, I, I've grown to really appreciate what this man stood for. And if he only was here today, I think he's probably one of the few individuals that probably could bring some peace to some of the situations we see there. But he said, hate begets hate. Violence begets violence. Toughness begets a greater toughness. We must meet the forces of hate with the power of love. But you know what? Hate can cause us to do so many things. And we've seen in society what it's done. He also said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence. Adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And when you think about when there's strife and conflict, um, when we're struggling with anger, people want to, they want to lash out. They want to hit something or hit someone. When that comes, and that may, that may come of you, think about Christ and what he endured. And you know what? Martin Luther King was very, was absolutely right. Love is the only thing that can cure our hearts, not hatred. Not showing you that I'm stronger than you and I can do bad things to you, but rather that I love you. Anger in the bosom of fools. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. When we don't have God in our hearts and love in our hearts, guess what? There's a void there. And you know what? That void many times is filled with anger and frustration and hatred toward others. The Bible says they're a fool. Don't let anger be in your heart, in your bosom. Cast that thing, get it, get, get it away, get away from it. Get it out of your heart. He says, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly and a man of wicked intentions is hated. If Satan wants to get us to react emotionally, did you ever go to a basketball game, football game, volleyball game, and watch people, what happens when a bad call is being made? You know, these people are, these referees are human, right? They make mistakes. You may have seen it. He's looking somewhere else, right? He wasn't looking over here. He's looking over here. We lose our mind, right? We say, we yell things. We say things. Call them any, any kind of name you can think of. You'll, you'll hear said. And I, my, I admire these referees who, who stand there and take it. But I'll tell you, that's what Satan's trying to get us to do. Because that, that play, it's ha there's constantly plays happening quickly, quickly, quickly. And so when you see that, you're, if you're going to get your word in, you gotta, you got to go, man. you got to say it right now. Or you, it's going, right? This is my only chance. And you do. And you'll see fans going at each other and yelling at each other. That's a quick-tempered man. That's a quick-tempered woman. That's what happens. And so next time you go to a game, just think about Okay, I'm not going to be quick-tempered. Is what happens what's quick-tempered? He acts foolishly. But again, you'll see the best and the worst people come out in these kind of events. On the other hand, a referee can return a soft answer, right? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I am sure I've never been to any referee train. I should have talked to Mike back there and, and Ty's not here with this. I'm sure any part of that, you've got to keep your cool, right? Because people are going to get upset and they're going to yell. And guess what? Guess who wins? Whoever can yell the loudest and say the meanest things, they're the winners, right? That's what people believe. And you'll see these referees will be calm. They may say, you know what? Take them out of here. <laughs> That's their response. 
I mean, how many times you've been in an argument or seen two people in an argument and they're just going back and forth and it's just, it's nasty to watch. It's just who can say the nastiest things and, and yell the loudest and say the most curse words. You ever been in a situation where that's happened and the other person sits there and just as calm as can be and they speak back softly and they've got total control of themselves. They're not getting whatever's being said to them. It's not rattling them. It's not shaking them up. You know, these are also the players that do really well. You know, Michael Jordan talked about why he made so many shots because he missed a lot and he knew how to forget that. Players that can keep their head and not let those things emotionally get a hold of them. That's not me speaking. But Proverbs says there, soft answer turns away wrath. And you'll see things just calm the water. Just all of a sudden, it's a raging storm. And the water's just calm. And soon I'm talking about when Jesus said, peace, be still. And that water just calmed. That's what happens when you have a soft answer. And that soft answer is from a heart that is thinking clearly. That's what we need to strive for. Harsh words going to just make it worse. You just like throw gasoline on it, right? It's not going to make anything better. And so we need to we need to obviously be thinking and have control of ourselves. And we're full of rage and full of anger. We're not thinking right. A pure adrenaline and pure emotion gets the best of us. We're told in Proverbs 15, 18, a wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. It takes two to tango, right? And um, but if we're slow and we things are going to happen to us, we've said that the words are going to be said, things are going to be done to us, but it takes two people to, to, to drive this wrath and anger and let that thing blow out of control. You know, they've said, you know, you know how to teach a kid who likes to bite, how to stop him of doing that. And I'm sure most of you heard it. Find another kid that likes to bite and put those two together. I don't think that's probably the right thing to do, but I'm saying I've heard that said before. But that doesn't help, right? A wrathful man stirs up strife. He is slow to anger, allays contention. He who is slow to anger, I love this, this verse. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. You know, some of the people that I have the most respect for in this world, and some of those men are in this congregation and women, they have control of themselves. And I've seen them in very stressful situations, and I've seen them rule their spirit. And it says they're better than the mighty, and he's better than a man, the man who takes a city. It's something we should strive for. Self-control. We need to we need to strive for mastery of our emotions because it's so easy to let the world and let what happens to us. We need to rule our spirit. That spirit is a part of us that makes decisions and, and is what causes us to react when we when things are done to us. We need to be slow to anger. And you know what? I've got a lot of slides, and I'm not going to get through them today. So we're going to finish this up tonight. I actually want to talk about a little bit about peacemakers tonight. But I, I again, encourage you, and uh, there you get a little highlight of tonight's lesson. Um, I'll just finish on this slide. The anger and having control of ourselves is so important. Anger, when it's unchecked, is going to lead to a lonely, miserable, godless life. That's where, that's, your, that's where you're going to end up. You let anger get the, the most of you and the best of you, this is what happens. You're going to be miserable. People are going to not want to be around you. You may think that you've got the best of someone, and I, I showed those people, but you know what? People aren't going to want to be around you. This life is going to be nothing but miserable and, and a, even more miserable is what is coming after this life. The gospel of Christ leads to love, joy, peace, and eternal life. And so the decision is, is a simple one. Don't let anger rule your life. Don't be looking for a fight. 
Strive for peace. Be a peacemaker. You've listened well, appreciate your good attention. We now turn uh, and, and offer up the invitation of Jesus. In this life, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be challenges. But I can, Jesus, Jesus assures us that he's got a home waiting for us there in John 14. In my father's house are many mansions. Is that, isn't that where we all want to go? Absolutely want to go there. And you know what? That place is so beautiful. I hasn't seen, ear, nor ear heard, nor entered the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Probably my favorite verse in the Bible. As much as I can imagine and dream about this place, it, I, I can't fathom it. I can't wait to see it. But you know what? If you're not a Christian, you're not going to, you have no chance of going there. And so you believe in Jesus. There's nothing preventing you coming forward. Make that great confession. You know what? I believe Jesus Christ is son of God. And I'm not going to live my life any, any more like this. I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my life. And then I want to be baptized. And you'll be on your, your way. That's all it takes. It's not any more complicated than that. Lord's invitation is open. If we can assist you in any way, please come while we stand, while we sing.